Taiwan, where I'm, I'm based, it's a very interesting uh, case because it is pretty much the only country on the face of the planet that is not a member of WHO, uh, has not been able to have the kind of interactions with WHO that other countries have enjoyed. Uh, and yet, bar none, it has had the most successful uh, response to and controls uh, since day one of the of the outbreak. So once again, that raises a bunch of questions about the utility of WHO and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are poured into that institution if the country that has fared best in dealing with COVID-19 is a country that is not a member. It's not so much that we do not need a WHO, uh, but like other UN institutions, we need to make sure that the WHO uh, fulfills its mandate and does not uh, focus its, its attention on any particular country. Uh, no matter how small or large a donor it is to its uh, to its funding. Just what can the U.S., Canada, and the rest of the world learn from Taiwan in dealing with communist China, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? What accounts for Taiwan's success in containing the CCP virus, despite Taiwan's exclusion from the WHO and its proximity to mainland China? And how has the Chinese regime subverted the WHO the UN, and other international organizations. What can democratic countries do to counter this threat? In this episode, we sit down with J. Michael Cole, a senior fellow with the Global Taiwan Institute in Washington and the Macdonald Laurier Institute in Ottawa. He is also a former analyst at the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, in Ottawa. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Michael Cole, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thanks for having me. There's so many things I'd like to speak with you about. You know, you are uh, Canadian as I am, and uh, we have this very interesting vantage point to look at look at the world uh, uh, through, uh, I guess, a specific kind of Canadian eyes. And we'll, we'll jump into that a little bit uh, later. Let's start by talking about the controversy right now around the WHO. And I know you have some very concrete thoughts about this. On one side, we have uh, President Trump uh, basically defunding the WHO from the US side, pending a review temporarily, of course, uh, uh, you know, to sort of assess uh, its efficacy in, in the face of the Chinese Communist Party. On the other hand, you have Bill Gates the biggest donor, you know, I think after the U.S. to the World Health Organization saying this is dangerous at this time during the pandemic. Um, what are your thoughts? Right. Well, uh, I mean, it's it's weeks in the making. Uh, we've had mounting discontent with the manner in which the WHO has responded uh, to the pandemic. And, you know, with revelations that it had information very early in the outbreak in, in Wuhan uh, that if it had been acted upon would very likely uh, have had a mitigating impact on the spread of, of the virus. Now, uh, organizations like the WHO are filled with human beings. They're, they're fallible. They can commit mistakes. That's understandable. Uh, what has made that whole issue a bit more controversial now is the fact that on several instances, uh, top WHO officials seem to be uh, collaborating with the Chinese regime uh, in uh, failing to reveal some information that if made public, uh, although would have been beneficial to the international community in combating the outbreak, uh, probably would have made the regime in China look bad. So now we're starting to see more and more calls for, for scrutiny and uh, President Trump's uh, threat of withhold, withholding uh, funding is part of that initiative uh, until we've had a thorough investigation into what what went wrong at the WHO and reasons why uh, that occurred. So is this a good idea, uh, given the balance of things? And I mean, and you're looking at this from also another unique vantage point, which is being in Taiwan, right, for, for a de over a decade. Well, again, Again, the um, I, I'm a bit wary. I mean, I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a final defunding of WHO by United States. I think I would have serious issues if that were the case. Uh, it is really uh, contingent on the proper investigation being carried out. 
Uh, what I would argue needs to be avoided, however, is any initiative or anything that would give the Chinese regime an opportunity to increase its influence at WHO. Uh, it has sufficient uh, funds, for example, that if it chose to compensate for the money that uh, WHO is not getting from the United States, uh, with that inevitably would come increased influence and, and again, possibly more problems uh, of the type that we're currently asking for. Now, you mentioned Taiwan, where I'm, I'm based. It's a very interesting uh, case because it is pretty much the only country on the face of the planet that is not a member of WHO, uh, has not been able to have the kind of interactions with WHO that other countries have enjoyed, uh, and yet, bar none, it has had the most successful uh, response to and controls uh, since day one of the of the outbreak. So once again, that raises a bunch of questions about the utility of WHO and the hundreds of millions of dollars that are poured into that institution if the country that has fared best in dealing with COVID-19 is a country that is not a member. You know, absolutely. And there's been a lot of, you know, discussion about this exact issue. I mean, you've written extensively, actually, about the success of Taiwan. So you have this kind of very, uh, I guess, deeper perspective than a lot of people on how that played out, why Taiwan has been so effective. I'm wondering if you could tell me, well, first of all, there's this kind of interesting scenario of how Taiwan realized there was this issue in late December. Maybe you could just kind of outline that story. I think it's incredibly fascinating and amazing. And then just kind of dig into that a bit deeper uh, about how Taiwan has responded. Sure. Well, it started on uh, December 31st, uh, or around December 31st, when a female uh, scientist at Taiwan Centers for Disease Control uh, came upon a message on an online bulletin board called a PTT, uh, which, in which the, uh, the anonymous poster said that there were signs that uh, of some epidemic uh, that was similar to SARS, uh, from 2003, uh, and that people were already being isolated and, and quarantined and whatnot. Uh, now, that, uh, that uh, scientist at Taiwan CDC then was able to get in touch with that individual who made the post, who to this day has remained anonymous, uh, but she wanted to make sure that there was, it was a credible, credible post. It wasn't disinformation, uh, which we all have suffered from in, in recent years. Uh, after ascertaining the veracity of that claim, uh, she turned to counterparts in medical uh, systems in Taiwan and in China. Uh, and when they were able to establish that indeed uh, groups of individuals were being quarantined, uh, which certainly suggested human to human transmissibility, uh, the Taiwan CDC decided on December 31st uh, to send an email to the WHO uh, alerting them to the fact that there was a high likelihood that there was human-to-human -human transmission uh, in Wuhan. Uh, as we now know, has been re revealed recently, that uh, letter went unanswered or certainly not acted upon. Uh, and it took several days before, if not weeks, before WHO would adopt the measures that immediately the Taiwanese government decided to adopt uh, to make sure that it would not be unduly affected by the outbreak, not knowing what it was, uh, knowing full well that China is not always transparent when it comes to these things. Uh, so Taiwan has decades of experience having to deal with a problematic CCP across the Taiwan Strait. So rather than depend on information that was given them by the Chinese side, they immediately decided to ban flights uh, from Huan and, and related provinces. Uh, and that is one of the key reasons why Taiwan was able from, from the outset to adopt the kind of measures that have prevented the spread of the virus in, in Taiwan. Right. So it's and it's not just the initial response, which, of course, probably was the most critical to you know, understand that there's something happening. Um, but it's also, you know, the subsequent measures which have been remarkable. Yeah, well, banning banning flights was, as I said, was an essential element of that of its, of that strategy, uh, but also the kind of monitoring and surveillance that was immediately implemented, uh, 
they also um, activated their, their central command center, uh, which had been identified, or lack thereof, had been identified as a, uh, as a foible in Taiwan's response to SARS in 2003. Uh, they have a number of top officials who had played a key role in combating SARS in 2003. So they built upon a lot of experience. Uh, they also benefited from a society that is probably a little bit more willing to allow the government to intrude upon their civil liberties when uh, the situation calls for it. And they, they realized that that was one of those situations. Uh, but again, use, using AI, cell phones, connecting different databases in Taiwan to quickly track individuals who had already visited uh, problematic areas. I mean, as you know, there's about 1.5 million Taiwanese who work in China. Uh, so that, that meant that there was a very high risk of these individuals bringing the virus back to Taiwan. So immediately they implemented uh, isolation measures, quarantine measures, uh, and again, using AI and cell phone tracking to uh, make sure that those individuals were respecting uh, the 14-day quarantine. Uh, and those who had been identified were immediately brought to hospitals and, and given proper treatment. So, but the early response, as I as I said earlier, was definitely, uh, I would say, the one area where Taiwan uh, was well ahead of other countries in its in its response. And now we're uh, we're we're seeing uh, we're certainly seeing the benefits of of that decision. You know, something that just strikes me, you know, given the incredible amount of political influence that the Chinese Communist Party can exert on global institutions. And frankly, this is one of your areas, and we're going to dig in to that more uh, in a moment. Um, does it make sense, for example, in this sort of reality for the U.S. to be, you know, basically deeply connected with the Taiwanese health system going forward, assuming status quo, assuming you know, things don't change politically, which they might, given the current reality. Well, what we're seeing now is, um, again, uh, COVID-19 has provided an opportunity for Taiwan to, you know, yet again demonstrate to the international community that it is a modern, advanced, high-tech society uh, and that has good intentions and wants to contribute to international uh, community for political reasons, uh, and given the structure of the United Nations, it's impossible for Taiwan to do that in that particular form. Uh, what we have seen in recent years, however, and that accompanies a reassessment, if you will, of uh, perceptions of China uh, in major democracies, particularly United States. Uh, with that has come a reevaluation of Taiwan's value as well and a growing recognition that, you know, keeping Taiwan out in the cold uh, is, is preposterous. Uh, it is self-defeating and not to, not to mention that it's unfair to the 23.8 million people in Taiwan. So now you've had countries like United States, but others, Japan, Czech Republic, uh, now Italy, France, a constellation of countries that are currently struggling uh, with their response to COVID-19, uh, working outside United Nations, so more at the bilateral level, uh, and collaborating with Taiwan on research uh, for test kits, for a uh, you know the medication that could address uh, the disease, but also Taiwan has uh, very quickly ramped up its industry to produce facial masks. Uh, so as we speak, they are pro producing approximately 15, 15 million anti masks daily. Uh, which allows Taiwan not only to provide its own citizens with sufficient masks, but also to export millions of masks to countries in need, including the United States. Uh, and they're not selling the masks to those countries like China has been doing. They are giving uh, those masks. So it is, it is humanitarian. It is no doubt publicity for Taiwan, and Taiwanese government is aware of this. Uh, but it's an unprecedented opportunity for Taiwan to demonstrate its abilities, its strengths, uh, and to prove to the world that in the 21st century, it makes absolutely no sense to keep Taiwan uh, outside of international institutions. If UN does not work, they will have to find uh, alternatives and, and you know, side mechanisms that would allow Taiwan to play the role that it should be playing. You know, it's almost like Taiwan is showing the world what a free and open China 
might actually look like, right? It... Well, it's, it's, it's certainly showcasing the, the benefits of democracy, of an open society with freedom of expression, uh, with people's ability to scrutinize their government, to criticize their government and not be disappeared when they do that. Um, now, that being said, uh, you know, Taiwan has its own idiosyncratic history. Uh, it is a much smaller, less complex place than China. Uh, so I don't think there is a direct, you know, we cannot directly apply all of Taiwan's experiences and say we put that model in China and this is what China would look like. Uh, the Chinese themselves will have, if this is the, the road that they choose for themselves, uh, they will have to come up with their own, you know, means and, and mechanisms to implement a democracy. It would be a lot more complicated than it is in Taiwan. And trust you, me, politics in Taiwan are very, uh, very polarized and complicated. Uh, but in China, it would be different by orders of magnitude. So, but certainly, uh, as I said, it demonstrates uh, the good things that come from having a government that respects the right of their people. Uh, to share information and to criticize when criticism is, is necessary. And now we're seeing the, the opposite of that in China. It is costing lives because people who needed to release information, who had crucial information, were prevented from sharing that information or were outright disappeared. And the entire world is paying for that. So one of the things that we've been uh, talking about in the past, you and I, is uh, this, and this is one of your specialties, is this, uh, you know, the in Chinese Communist Party influence operations. You actually, you know, looked at this, you know, firsthand recently during the Taiwan election, right? Um, and then, and now we're kind of seeing, you know, I don't know, perhaps all of this on steroids at this time. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of speak to how this how this is working. Maybe a little bit about what happened then, but but just how that how this what lessons can we take uh, and what what can we learn? What should people be looking for here? Mm. Well, it's a um, in 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 some weird way, it's the whole COVID-19 uh, outbreak has been a blessing for academics and journalists who, in recent years, have sought to tell that story to the international community. Uh, and to alert people in democracies and, and, and not even democracies that there is a gigantic, powerful authoritarian regime that has the means and the intent to uh, interfere in their, in their democratic processes whenever doing so was to Beijing's advantage. Uh, my response to that when people express surprise nowadays is uh, welcome to Taiwan's reality that has been its experience for decades. Uh, and particularly since 2016, when the uh, Taiwan-centric Democratic Progressive Party under Tsai Ing-wen uh, came back to power after eight years, during which the government in Taiwan had sought closer ties with Beijing. Uh, China retaliated immediately by resuming its efforts to poach official diplomatic allies of Taiwan. Uh, seven since uh, 2016 have chosen to recognize the PRC uh, and also to intensify uh, it's political warfare efforts. So that's a mix of disinformation, uh, co-optation, influence, uh, blackmail, uh, you name it. Every technique in the book that incorporates Unite Front Work Department, uh, People's Liberation Army, but also, you know, business people, uh, civil society, civic organizations, cultural organizations, organized crime. Uh, the CCP for, for many, many years has been very good at providing an overarching strategy and then enabling different players uh, in targeted societies to play a role in these. Uh, no doubt in, in the past decade, uh, a good number of individuals and organizations that were able uh, to uh, start businesses in Taiwan uh, have been called upon by the CCP on occasion to play a role. Uh, the fact that uh, there is a deep interdependence between Taiwan and China on, on, on the economy, that means that there are millions of people every year who are transiting from China to Taiwan and, and, and back and forth. So the opportunities for espionage, for influence, co-optation and whatnot are, are rife and they're daunting. Uh, the Taiwanese government has struggled over the years to respond to that challenge. Uh, but under Tsai Ing-wen's guidance, they have started implementing laws that made it possible to legally respond 
uh, to these efforts by by the Chinese. So we've certainly seen Taiwan being a democracy uh, efforts by the Chinese to influence the outcome of elections. Uh, and what we have seen so far is that the Taiwanese are resilient enough uh, and quite possibly aware enough of what the Chinese are up to uh, that thus far Chinese interference does not appear to have been able to sway elections, except in elections where the results were very close. Uh, but they were unsuccessful in 2016, so, so Tsai Ing-wen was elected. And she was seeking re-election after four years of contention in the Taiwan Strait uh, in January this year, and she was re-elected with the highest number of votes in the history of presidential elections in Taiwan. Uh, no doubt the fact that those elections occurred in the context of uh, serious trouble in Hong Kong, uh, in the context of Xi Jinping uh, promising the same formula for Taiwan that is failing miserably in Hong Kong, that is the one country to systems formula. Uh, and simply the, uh, the more belligerent, uh, less patient uh, tone that has been adopted under Xi Jinping uh, over the past eight years or so, uh, also has awakened and sensitized the Taiwanese to the fact that whatever it is that the Chinese uh, have to offer is simply uh, unacceptable uh, to Taiwanese society. So uh, in terms of lessons that Taiwan can share with the international community, well, there's a few areas for, like, for example, Buddhist temples that it's difficult to see a similar application or uses uh, in other places around the world, although there are Buddhist temples in other countries with large ethnic Chinese communities. Uh, but the mechanisms through which the Chinese co-opt uh, government officials, uh, business leaders, uh, media conglomerates, uh, civic society, uh, education uh, system, and all that certainly are uh, those are lessons that are applicable to countries worldwide. And as a response to this, in recent years, we've seen uh, United States taking the lead in organizing uh, conferences, bringing together Taiwan and other countries where people are sharing notes on, on combating disinformation, for example. And Taiwan has been called upon on several occasions in recent years to share its experiences uh, with other countries. And uh, the reception has been quite, uh, quite positive so far. You know, I just saw a Global Times piece, which is essentially egging on uh, the Democratic Party to attack uh, the, the administration, President Trump. Um, you know, this, it's kind of like a, you know, of course, a mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party. It, to me, it strikes me as kind of uh, blatant, in-your-face, overt election interference. Actually, something like what we saw in Taiwan, too, I think, right? Um, is, are there any lessons that uh, the U.S. can learn from how Taiwan dealt with that? Right. Well, uh, in the elections uh, this January, the uh, Tsai Ing-wen's opponent from the Guomindang, uh, Mr. Han Guoyu, was uh, seen as the Beijing favorite. Uh, Beijing made no secret of the fact that it hoped that he would be elected. Meanwhile, he was seeing all the right things from Beijing's perspective. So basically saying that Taiwan would embrace the preconditions that the Chinese have set for the resumption of dialogue and negotiations in the Taiwan Strait, which have been frozen since 2016. Uh, and immediately a, a politically savvy civil society in Taiwan and the media started looking into uh, Mr. Han's background uh, and problematic pronouncements and visits uh, to China where he met with individuals from Taiwan Affairs Office, and from uh, certain organizations that were suspected of, of having ties to United Front Work Department. A number of those meetings were held behind closed doors, and Mr. Han did not even reveal the nature of those meetings to the central government in Taipei. Uh, so by force of things, people became a little bit more skeptical. That compelled supporters of Tsai Ing-wen, people who want to defend Taiwan's democracy, to mobilize and come out to vote uh, in January. So in that particular instance, uh, we we saw a you know blowback, if you will, to Chinese efforts uh, to manipulate the elections. Now there's other ways that they can try to sway elections uh, using underground gambling, 
uh, or uh, co-opting politicians in local elections who happen to have interesting business uh, connections and ties back in China for themselves and their families, uh, including one candidate at the local level who said uh, late last year that nobody loves Taiwan more than Xi Jinping. Uh, comments like that immediately led to journalists and academics to dig up his connections. And we realized very quickly that every single member of his family uh, had business operations in a uh, experimental free trade zone where Taiwanese businesses have been encouraged in recent years uh, to make investments. So uh, awareness is, is key to combating uh, these types of, of efforts. Uh, you need a rigorous media. Uh, and of course, polarization, as we're seeing in the United States right now, but as we saw in Taiwan as well, uh, can be detrimental uh, because then it gets sucked into uh, the discourse and polarization and lead up to elections and all that. So you need people to uh, basically agree on certain fundamentals. And I think one fundamental is the defense of democratic institutions. Uh, and it is the role of media, civil society, and academics to shed light on, on these things. And so Taiwan has learned lessons, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, more than confident that it is willing uh, to sit down with partners, not just United States, but in, in Europe as well, uh, to share its experiences. They have developed a lot of knowledge in tracking IP addresses, uh, discovering where they are in China or where outside China, places like Malaysia, uh, where the Chinese have also tapped uh, to have people generate disinformation on, on social media. Uh, and co-optation of traditional media, the role of traditional media in recycling pro-Beijing disinformation uh, has been a reality in Taiwan. Uh, and as we saw with the Russian interference in elections in the U.S. in 2016, uh, we need to find ways to firewall traditional media uh, from this type of blatant disinformation as well uh, to make sure that it does not contribute to polarization and basically confusion within, uh, within society. Well, just one of the narratives that jumps out at me that it, I think the Chinese Communist Party has been incredibly successful at kind of putting into uh, uh, the American media or even consciousness is just simply the, the, what the number of deaths and the number of cases in China, which are, you know, look, look how small they are compared to the giant amount in the, Amer in the U.S., right? Yeah, that's that's the narrative that uh, that the Chinese regime has has cultivated and encouraged in, in in recent weeks. I mean, for the sake of the Chinese people, I hope that those numbers are are true. Uh, but the problem again is that a bit like you know econ economics in China, we cannot we simply cannot trust their numbers, uh, and the fact that the charts that we're seeing uh, coincide with. Uh, very clear efforts by Beijing to rewrite uh, the whole history of COVID-19, uh, including claims at some point that it did not even originate in China, uh, makes uh, those numbers all the more suspicious. Uh, and the problem, again, that brings us back to the lack of transparency uh, in China when it comes to anything that the CCP deems to be related to national security. Uh, the fact that it's accompanied by China kicking out a number of American journalists uh, at the height of the epidemic, uh, the fact that increasingly it silences not only its own journalists, but also human rights activists, uh, even medical experts, uh, to me makes it very difficult to believe that the numbers that were being given uh, reflect the reality uh, of the case. Now, like any government, uh, the Chinese government uh, has to strike a balance between public safety and the economy. Uh, my sense is that uh, the situation had reached a point uh, in China that um, if it did not reopen uh, manufacturers, did not restart business, uh, the cost to the economy in China could have been catastrophic. And as we know, the CCP has built up its whole reputation as the one party that can continue that miraculous economic growth for the Chinese. Uh, so I suspect that we have reached a point in, in that particular story where China is giving more weight to, to the economy than it is to public safety. But it simply cannot admit that having made that decision it has contributed to a, uh, you know, a second wave 
of COVID-19 in China. Hence, in my opinion, uh, the cover-up. Now, if we had a WHO that does not, as we suspect, uh, has not been co-opted, if I dare use the term, uh, by the Chinese, if it were able to conduct independent uh, research in China, uh, perhaps the WHO would be providing different numbers. But the price of access for the WHO, it seems, is to regurgitate and to replicate whatever statistic uh, the Chinese regime uh, gives it. So, you know, and, but then, and that's the question, and I'm sure this is what the administration people were saying to each other, you know, uh, uh, advising the president, you know, so what's the utility of the WHO if, if they do that? Yeah, well, it's, it's global coordination. It's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to, to state that there is no role for, for WHO and it has expertise, it has networks that should be able to bring you know, experts worldwide together and, and prompt best responses. But I think the politicization of WHO, given the nature of the man who heads that organization right now and how he arrived at, at that position uh, and his seeming willingness to, um, you know, focus a little bit too much on pleasing China as opposed to doing what is right by international community, uh, raises questions uh, as well. So it's not so much that we do not need a WHO. Uh, but like other UN institutions, we need to make sure that the WHO uh, fulfills its mandate and does not uh, focus its, its attention on any particular country, uh, no matter how small or large a donor it is to its, uh, to its funding. Um, what are your concerns about uh, how Dr. Tedros uh, reached his position? Yeah, uh, in, in uh, 2017, when the elections were held uh, to replace Margaret Chan from Hong Kong, who was his, uh, his predecessor, um, there were already, uh, well, he's from Ethiopia, and there already was a movement in Ethiopia that opposed uh, his becoming uh, WHO Director General. Uh, his affiliations with a Marxist-Leninist political party was uh, already troublesome. Uh, it is my understanding that the political party that he belongs to uh, was at one point designated as a terrorist entity by the U.S. State Department. Uh, there is the fact that he would have become the very first DG of, at the WHO who is not, does not have a medical background. Uh, but also very obvious was the fact that he was Beijing's uh, preferred candidate. Uh, from the outset had made it clear that he would respect Beijing's one China, so-called one China principle, uh, that he would not be uh, open to ways by which Taiwan could play a role within the organization, if only as an observer. Uh, one of his main opponents in that election in 2016, uh, 2017 uh, had suggested that he was more amenable to Taiwan being involved in some in some fashion at the WHO. Uh, that was a red line that wasn't acceptable to Beijing. So they they seem to have used their, their uh, large influence at the, the um, world, at, at the uh, General Assembly, United Nations, and particularly African votes uh, to make sure that its preferred candidate, Mr. Tedros, was, uh, was finally elected, and he was. And immediately upon being elected, he restated his commitment to the One China Principle. And now his behavior, as I said, suggests that he uh, he is now uh, paying Beijing back, so he owes them. Fascinating. Well, so, you know, the obvious thing we should talk about now is, you know, China or the Chinese Communist Party's encroachment into in, and influence in international institutions, especially the UN, which is, you know, something that, that is a big topic for you. Um, uh, how deep is it? Right. Well, um, again, given recent incidents, uh, not only at the WHO, but there was a bit of a controversy uh, during Lunar New Year uh, when another UN agency, so ICAO, the Montreal-based ICAO that deals with uh, civil, civil aviation, uh, was approached online by a number of American academics uh, and basically simply asked the question, 
uh, again, given the the snowballing outbreak, uh, why is it? How can we explain that Taiwan uh, is excluded and has no ability to obtain uh, flight records that it needs to be able to track individuals who may have visited contaminated areas? Uh, the reaction of ICAO, which is also uh, headed by a Chinese national like uh, Liu Hong, uh, was to suspend. Uh, or to block all those accounts. And dozens upon dozens of accounts on Twitter were blocked. Uh, and subsequent efforts by government officials reaching out to IKO, uh, reaching out to United Nations in, in New York City, and basically being told uh, they, they stood by the decision of IKO in Montreal to block those accounts. They never provided the kind of logical answer that people were looking for. Uh, and they themselves started accusing Taiwan of launching, of using its internet army to launch an attack to discredit ICAO, uh, which was very much a, a forerunner to the accusations last week by Mr. Tedros that Taiwan had orchestrated a racist campaign against him and black individuals worldwide. Um, subsequent investigation demonstrated that those accounts that had attacked him were in fact uh, based in China and uh, users uh, pretended to be Taiwanese, but they were uh, in fact Chinese. So uh, ICAO and WHO were two clear examples of organizations uh, that seemed to be towing Beijing's line, even at a time when the international community should be transcending those politics, if only momentarily, to respond to that crisis. Uh, up until recently, until he was disappeared in China, uh, Interpol was headed by a Chinese national who was a senior official at the Ministry of State Security. Uh, so that certainly raised all sorts of flags for individuals who are critics of the Chinese regime, uh, whether they be Tibetans or Uyghurs or Falun Gong practitioners or Taiwanese. Uh, now they fear that they could be uh, arrested uh, in any country and then sent to China. Uh, to face its its horrible uh, criminal justice system. So that certainly focused minds. Uh, so there are a number of specialized UN agencies uh, that are currently either headed by Chinese nationals, oftentimes who were elected due to pressure behind, uh, behind closed doors by the Chinese, uh, or individuals who are not Chinese nationals, but for some reason, possibly co-optation, are also acting at the behest of the of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the, the issue is more fundamental than simply uh, specialized UN agencies. The UN General Assembly uh, has become a main battleground where China, again, is using its influence with smaller countries uh, that are in uh, dire need of infrastructure investment. So China is offering uh, the promise of, of an investment in return for those countries voting in bloc uh, to allow Beijing to reshape the United Nations, if you will, uh, or to pass amendments or bills that are favorable uh, to the Chinese. Uh, through these initiatives, the Chinese have started rewriting the very definition of human rights, uh, of freedom of expression, uh, has gotten some of its individuals appointed to human rights council, and now they get to appoint uh, the special reporters who will be looking at forced disappearance, uh, freedom of expression and whatnot. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that those individuals would uh, be willing or even able to criticize anything that the Chinese regime is doing in China or within its neighborhood. Uh, and one last point, uh, you know, influenced by Chinese at, uh, at COSOC, uh, cultural organizations at the United Nations, and as we saw in recent years, uh, very serious bribery controversies involving uh, secretary generals of the UN General Assembly. Uh, so the China Energy Fund Committee, uh, Patrick Her, who was arrested in New York City in 2017, who currently sits in prison in the United States uh, for bribing UN officials. Uh, John Ash. Um, now, the American legal system and the FBI and Justice Department uh, took action uh, against these individuals. But the problem is that to this day, uh, the UN Secretary General has, uh, it is said, has blocked any attempt to conduct a thorough investigation into these 
uh, these controversies within the United Nations. So if the individual at the very top of the organization is not willing uh, to shed light on possible uh, nefarious influence by the Chinese regime, by an authoritarian regime at the UN, uh, no wonder it will have a trickle-down effect on every single UN organization, and this is what we're, we're seeing right now. So the WHO is a focus right now, but it's, it simply symbolizes uh, the more fundamental and certainly more troubling uh, situation that United Nations right now. And uh, which brings us back to the question, should we defund? Should we pull out of those organizations? The problem, if we do that, we know for a fact that the Chinese will fill that void and in so doing will exacerbate its influence uh, within the system. So what I would say this calls upon instead is for a group of, a concert of democracies to once again work together, be very serious about reshaping the United Nations and bringing it, bringing it back to, to its original mandate uh, as it was formulated uh, following World War II with necessary adjustments to reflect current realities. Uh, but certainly not yield to revisionist authoritarian regimes that whose value system is completely contrary to what we believe in. Yeah, I mean, there's this huge irony because, you know, these regimes, their ideologies are basically counter to the UN Charter, right? I mean, it, it, and yet uh, they're gaining control. I mean, of course, when I say they, it's China in the lead, of course, by, by a margin. But... Um, you know, it, a lot of people, to your point, a lot of people are kind of, that I've been speaking with, are kind of giving up. Like, I don't think this can be reformed. You know, that's what, that's what I'm hearing. I'm not saying that, but um, uh, what, what would you say to those people? Right, well, it, it remains to be seen. I think now we're, uh, we're facing, you know, it feels like we're back in 1946, 1947 right now. Uh, democracies are exhausted. They've lost their footing. Uh, they don't want a big fight again, uh, and they see this seemingly implacable, unstoppable uh, regime that is gaining ground by the day. Uh, back then it was the Soviets, now it's China. So there's a, um, there's a conjunction of variables right now that uh, seems to make it very difficult for democracies to work together. And, you know, there's no hiding the fact that European countries have difficulty dealing with the United States right now. Uh, I think many people have forgotten who their real friends are. And um, as I said, this um, atmosphere of, 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 of uh, pessimism, uh, pessimism that, that has descended upon, on, on a number of, of countries, uh, China is exploiting that moment. Uh, the economic crisis uh, in the late 1990s was first step in that in that ladder, if you will, 9-11, uh, uh, Afghanistan war, Iraq war, so the distraction that came with that and the huge uh, expenses that came uh, with, the, with that moment for the United States. Um, China seized all these opportunities. It always, it's a cliche, but it thinks uh, in the long term uh, and it will exploit any opportunity, including crises. Uh, to its advantage to, uh, to get one up on its on its adversaries. And that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, is that battle winnable at the United Nations? I don't know. I can't predict the future. Uh, but I think we don't want to give up until we have seen this concert of democracies, influential democracies, uh, with global weight, uh, with a lot of money, to really truly work together as one uh, and not allow themselves to be divided by the Chinese and uh, you know, give the Chinese and other revi revisionist regimes like like Russia and Iran, uh, for example, you know, give them a good fight at the UN. Uh, we don't want to abandon that institution, flawed though it is, uh, simply by by giving up and ceding it to the Chinese. Because I I don't think any of us would want to live in a world uh, where UN institutions are reflecting uh, the kind of value system that exists in in China today. Well, you know. Now what I'm thinking about is this letter, recent letter that you uh, that that went out that you signed, a kind of a response to this Asia Society sponsored letter, which is calling for cooperation with China and so forth. Um, your letter that you signed is saying, well, actually, China, uh, Chinese Communist Party is facing a Chernobyl moment. A number of our 
uh, guests in past weeks have talked about this. Um, what is it that this letter is saying, I, this is the first time we're talking about it on this show, and it's, it's quite a remarkable group of another hundred intellectuals that focus on China talking about this. Right. Well, again, uh, I don't think anyone who signed that letter opposes collaboration with, with China. Uh, given the stakes, we cannot not collaborate with China, or at least hope to collaborate with China. Uh, the problem is that uh, we cannot approach China naively uh, or without the expectation that China is going to try to, you know, use that 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 opportunity to uh, to advance its own uh, its own interests. And I think by this point, it has gotten quite clear that under the CCP, uh, a kind of purely altruistic collaboration simply does not exist. Now, no country is is entirely altruistic in what it does. Uh, but there are limits to the crass exploitation that we have experienced in, in recent days or in recent weeks. Uh, so the letter was basically, uh, again, in response to alert people to the fact that the CCP is, or China is for all intents and purposes, the Chinese government is the CCP. It remains a Marxist-Leninist regime. Uh, and it has a very, uh, very clear ideology, which does not coincide with ours. Uh, and it has already, as we state, we, we name a number of names, individuals, the kind of individuals that we would like to collaborate with are the people who are being silenced, who are being disappeared by the Chinese regime. Uh, and those are the people that international society would count upon uh, to formulate a proper response to COVID-19. So it's a, again, it's, it's not a disagreement, at least the way I see it and when I signed that letter, it is not a call for uh, isolating China or not reaching out to China, uh, but simply a, a, an attempt, again, to encourage people to approach China very carefully uh, with, with open eyes and, and with, the co with you know, consciousness that the Chinese may try a few tricks in, in the process as well. And, you know, and to call for the release of the individuals that we would like to work with in China. Um, but uh, given the Global Times' response to our letter today, uh, it does not appear that our efforts will be will result in uh, in China changing its uh, its ways. One thing as well, some headlines have said uh, Chernobyl moment for for China. I think it's a bit of a false analogy because the Chernobyl moment in the USSR uh, in 1986 uh, occurred in the context of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev having launched uh, Glasnost and Perestroika. So he was already in the process of opening up. Uh, society and, and civil liberties in, in China, in, uh, in the USSR, certainly freedom of expression. And Chernobyl for him became the, the one incident where it became impossible to continue uh, with the old ways of, of lying to the international community. Uh, back then it was Hans Blake of IATA, um, of a, a, Atomic Agency, who visited uh, the site and was completely blindsided uh, by Soviet officials. Um, and Gorbachev eventually realized that that could no longer function and, and the key to survival was to open up, to allow the media to scrutinize what was going on, but also to criticize uh, Soviet officials in Ukraine, uh, in Russia, who had contributed to uh, initial hiding of what was going on at, at, uh, at Chernobyl. So the context is very different. Uh, COVID-19 occurs at a time when Xi Jinping was tightening controls. Uh, around China well before COVID-19 uh, in response partly to developments in Hong Kong uh, and possibly to economic slowdown in China. We don't know what the numbers are, but there are signs certainly uh, that the economy was slowing down. Uh, the fact that he feels compelled to have concentration camps in Xinjiang, to me, does not signal a leader who feels that he has things under control. Uh, the fact that they would block foreign media, that they would expel foreign reporters, make the lives of civic, of, of activists and, and, and academics increasingly difficult in China. Uh, so it's the exact opposite of what uh, Gorbachev was trying to do in 1986. So the moment, uh, it is a moment for China, but I don't think it is a Chernobyl moment for, for China. Um, off the top of your head, <laughs> and I wonder how much you've thought about this, um, what scenario would guide China to, you know, that kind of a reality that we saw under Mikhail Gorbachev? 
Uh, well, Gorbachev made that decision not necessarily because he was um, he was a Democrat at heart. He certainly had the inclinations, uh, but it simply was a matter of survival. Uh, he wanted the Soviet Union to uh, to prosper, uh, but all the internal contradictions, the economy, uh, war in Afghanistan, uh, and the fact that they were holding together an empire that was it was slowly breaking apart um, at the edges. All these things came together to compel him to embark upon Glasnost and, and Perestroika, so basically loosening uh, restrictions on freedom of expression and political activity in, in, in the Soviet Union. Um, barring a similar uh, conjunction of internal contradictions in, in China, I find it extremely difficult to imagine that in the foreseeable future, we're going to have a secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party who would willingly embark upon uh, a program similar to what Gorbachev did. In fact, the Chinese regime closely studied the demise of the Soviet Union uh, and does not think highly of Mikhail Gorbachev and basically looks at him as one of the key reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed. Now, CCP does not want that or a similar outcome for itself, so that creates all the incentives to move in the opposite direction and you know embrace of of a uh, of a market economy to you know, rejuvenate the economy and make sure that he that the China does not face. Uh, the kind of uh, economic catastrophe in the making uh, in Soviet Union. Uh, but my sense is that uh, eventually contradictions will catch up with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, at some point, uh, the strict censorship measures and controls that it has implemented upon society will constrain the kind of imagination and creativity that China will need to constantly meet these challenges and reinvent itself. Uh, demographics, uh, rapidly aging society, uh, environmental catastrophe in the making, all these things will catch up eventually. And I think we may reach a point within the next 15, 20 years uh, when the CCP will have no choice but to uh, liberalize uh, China so that people can really, really engage in the kind of free exchange of information and creativity that is needed. Uh, to meet those challenges. Once you do that, it becomes very difficult to maintain the kind of control on society uh, that the Chinese are, are currently enjoying. So I think it's a ticking bomb. Uh, it might be ugly when it happens, and would also depend on the choices that the Chinese people themselves uh, make for their country. Uh, but I do not believe that the kind of system that they have right now is sustainable in, in the long term. So you think your 15, 20 years sounds like a very long time? Well, uh, different analyses point to uh, the next decade being uh, where China will be at the apex of its, of its power. Uh, and after that, uh, the contradictions that I'm listing in aging society and all that uh, will start uh, undermining that, uh, that uh, ability for China to really exert uh, its influence. Uh, so it's going to be a gradual slope as well. It's not going to end immediately after after 10 years. Uh, but demographics, again, are key. But of, of course, the international context uh, will, uh, will play a large role. China does not operate in a vacuum. Uh, if it starts uh, facing more challenges, external challenges, uh, pushback, uh, if that has an impact on its ability to uh, invest overseas and and uh, and continue to generate rapid economic growth. All these things could also accelerate uh, economic slowdown in in China and could certainly encourage uh, more rapid you know economic liberaliz uh, political liberalization. But that this is all this is all speculation. Uh, I don't think we want to um, uh, forget that the CCP has survived uh, several challenges in the past. So it is, uh, it has the ability to adjust uh, and it is very quick on its, on its feet as well. So predictions of a collapse, of a rapid demise, uh, I think are, are certainly premature. 
but certainly history demonstrates that even the seemingly undefeatable authoritarian regimes of the past eventually uh, collapsed of their own of their own doing. And I don't see in the long term why China would be would be any different. But we can all argue on as to the the timeline. Right, right. No, exactly. I mean, I was uh, my mother uh, escaped from communist Poland in the 70s. And, you know, just talking with her even recently, she herself didn't believe in a million years that the Soviet Union would ever collapse. She imagined that it was, you know, sort of uh, permanent. And I imagine a lot of a lot of uh, Chinese believe that uh, simply because of the conditioning. This is a big you know, a kind of big internal information battle, right, that the <laughs> CCP has been waging uh, for decades, that it's, that's, that it's good, great, glorious and good. I, I, I forget the exact um, <laughs> terminology. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about the Canadian context. We don't, I don't get a chance to talk about this very much, um, but I, I actually think it's quite important. And I think, you know, you, you and I have certainly been thinking about this a lot more than a lot of, the lo than a lot of people. Um, you know, I, what I've been very concerned about is it seems like uh, the Canadian authorities, the Canadian government have taken an overly credulous approach to communist China. I mean, uh, so, some, I don't know if it's like the WHO, but, but, but something much closer to that, and certainly a heck of a lot closer to that than Taiwan, right, in, in its kind of unique, unique reality. And so I guess you know, my immediate thought is, you know, what can Canada learn from Taiwan? But I mean, I, I even, I was just looking at this quote from uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, the chief public health officer, uh, you know, she was talking about that, you know, she didn't, she, the, the idea behind the policy was that they didn't want to do anything that would very negatively impact China, um, which is trying it very hard to do its best, and that, you know, imposing tough measures uh, can impede whether the country in the future will ever share anything transparently with others. You know, and this is, this sounds like the kind of mantra that, 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 that you know, the WHO might say or something. And I, I'm very concerned for the Canadian government, for Canadian society um, with the approach. I don't, can you give us some insight? Right, well, um, I know the Canadian government has, uh, you know, the Trudeau administration has faced a uh, fair amount of criticism uh, over its, you know, seemingly pro-Beijing signaling uh, throughout throughout the crisis. They have been very very careful uh, to not uh, alienate Beijing, and that 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 policy precedes COVID nineteen as well. Uh, it's been like that on on several issues. Um, the problem with Canada is that. Uh, from in my opinion, and I, I do travel to Ottawa quite often and interact with uh, with government and all that. Uh, policy making when it comes to China has been hijacked by uh, big business. Uh, those individuals who made fortunes uh, in China oftentimes uh, are advisors to prime minister's office. Uh, they sponsor and fund most of the think tanks across Canada. Uh, and uh, with no exception, have adopted a very pro-Beijing position when it comes to trade with China, when it comes to Huawei, uh, when it comes to not criticizing China over human rights, uh, even when it comes to the issue of having our two Canadian nationals currently held hostage in China uh, released. And that includes former prime ministers, people like Jean Chrétien, uh, and a constellation of other individuals who have served in government, a federal or, or local, uh, oftentimes have been offered lucrative uh, positions as consultants for Chinese companies, uh, or simply continue to represent the interests of large corporations uh, that oftentimes may even have played a role in getting them uh, elected or re-elected in Canadian politics. So again, there is, as, as we've seen in Taiwan with the business sector, there's this unhealthy relationship between policy making and unaccountable big businesses that are making billions of dollars in China. Uh, so all of this appears to have had an influence on, uh, again, the messaging uh, of the current government in Ottawa when it comes to uh, working with uh, 
with China. Now, Canada used to have a medical expert based in China uh, who probably would have been able to alert Canadian authorities very early as to what was going on. Uh, that position has been vacant for a number of years. So Canada has to rely on, on what WHO is, is giving it uh, and through its own channels, what the Chinese are, are providing as well. Uh, but we have seen a reluctance on the part of the Trudeau administration to uh, to criticize uh, you know Chinese inaction in the early stages uh, and uh, avoidance on most occasions of even mentioning a possible collaboration with Taiwan or even using the name Taiwan uh, in uh, within government. So we're seeing a very again a very and now we have an ambassador. Canada has an ambassador in Beijing. Uh, who also comes from the business world. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the kind of recommendations that he's making right now to the Kenyan government uh, are things that the Chinese regime would be uh, most happy with. So, so what would your recommendations, given uh, the reality you're describing, and I've certainly, I can corroborate some of that, I'm aware of some of these realities. Um, uh, what would your recommendation be uh, to the Canadian government today? I would I would certainly recommend the Kenyan government to um, you know treat this problem not as a bilateral issue between Canada and China, uh, but something that that truly really is global, which it is in when when we talk about COVID nineteen. Uh, but again, for Ottawa to really think seriously about who its real friends are, uh, which countries truly reflect the values and mores that define us as, as Canadians or how, what we like to think of ourselves as a you know, liberal democratic country that is progressive and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and in so doing, uh, while remaining pragmatic, um, working in concert again with other countries uh, and, 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 you know, I, I hate the term decouple. I don't think any country can completely decouple from China. Uh, but certainly find alternatives so that our entire policies are not held hostage, either by large businesses or by a country that provides us with facial masks. There are alternatives out there. Uh, but again, we're so deflated as democracies right now that the easiest way is just to give in to China, uh, remain silent on a few issues, and then we're going to get the masks, and then we're going to get this and get that. Uh, but I maintain that for all its faults, the United States remains Canada's truest and closest ally. Uh, and we need to transcend whatever differences we may have with whoever is in the White House right now. Uh, and at the government level, uh, and you know, the two societies really work together. There's no way that United States and Canada, we have plenty of, of trees in Canada, don't tell me we can't uh, create manufacturers and then have our own facial mask. Why do we have to buy them from China? Uh, but you need you need gumption. You need you need uh, you need leadership, and this is what has been lacking not just in in Canada, but in in a good number of countries right now. And that's why we're in the in the current situation where China gets away with doing all these things because the leadership is lacking. So I hope that the whole COVID nineteen outbreak serves as a moment of reckoning uh, among democracies that we need real leadership. We need real candidates with real ideas and maybe people who are a bit more willing to challenge the kind of status quo that the Chinese has imposed on us uh, in recent years. Uh, that probably signifies a bit more confrontation. There's gonna be costs, uh, but the problem is that, especially countries like Canada, we never tested the waters. The moment Beijing threatens something or expresses displeasure, we back away, we back off, and Beijing gets, gets what it wants. Uh, but uh, leaders oftentimes forget, especially countries like Canada, China needs our natural resources. China wants access to certain technologies that its own people still cannot produce. So it needs us at least as much as we need it. So that should give us the ability to push back on, on fundamentals and values that are dear to us. But for that, you need the leadership in Ottawa and in provinces that are willing to uh, to accept that there might be a cost initially, uh, but in in that kind of response, ultimately, I think we're going to be we're going to be stronger as a society. You know, that's it, it's very interesting, and I think we are seeing sort of rumblings of this among some uh, European nations. I think I think the UK, 
for example. I mean, to my eye, at least, uh, Boris Johnson has had a bit of a rude awakening uh, in, in terms of, you know, those, those bi bilateral uh, relations and, 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 you know, essentially what happened through this whole uh, coronavirus or CCP virus, as we call it, uh, thing. Now, f fascinating discussion. We're going to finish up in a moment. Uh, any final words? Well, I think you you just mentioned the important point of a of a bit of awakening or, or reckoning uh, in the UK. But um, you know, right now China seems to regard COVID nineteen as as an opportunity for it to expand its influence. Uh, but that whole enterprise could very well backfire as well because one thing that the Chinese Communist Party is not uh, proficient at is soft power. Uh, and in many countries, its offers of, of help or of assistance during the crisis uh, have been, you know, overtly transactional. They've been crushed. They're, they're seen as opportunistic, oftentimes accompanied by lecturing by Chinese uh, em embassies in, in those countries and expressions of displeasure by, uh, by Beijing for any country that does anything uh, with Taiwan. So we saw that recently in Czech Republic. Um, so the awareness that we spoke about earlier among Taiwanese when it comes to what it feels like or what the reality is of dealing with the CCP uh, is now something that is part of everybody's daily lives and it affects their health and the health of their loved ones. Uh, and when countries like France are told, yes, you will be given masks or we will sell you masks, but as a uh, quid pro quo, we want you to allow Huawei into your tele telecom systems. Uh, in times of crises, these kinds of uh, transactional transactions are not looked well upon uh, by countries and, and citizens of, uh, of those countries. Uh, and China, as I said, is, is, is not adept at extending uh, soft power and winning hearts and minds. That's one of the reasons why it has failed miserably over the years in Taiwan. Uh, and I think now that if it oversteps, it may uh, end up once this, this crisis is over, and I hope it ends eventually, uh, China could, rather than be in a stronger position, could find itself uh, in a position where people are increasingly skeptical of its intentions uh, and less willing to give it what it normally would have gotten away with. And again, that's all. that all stems from Xi Jinping's impatience uh, and his his way of uh, of, of governing, uh, and that could uh, that could bounce back and, and cost his regime uh, quite a bit in terms of reputation internationally. J. Michael Cole, such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you very much.